Well, good morning. Oh, my mic doesn't sound right. Can you hear me? All right. Good morning. Come on now. You guys have more strength than I do. Good morning. Oh, that's so much better. If you have a Bible with you, open it with me to Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 34, 18. As you're going there, I'm going to ask a personal question. Have you ever been faced with a situation in your life that was so painful that you just felt broken down? I'm asking if there's ever been a time in your life that was so dark that you just, your spirit was just crushed. Well, you're about to hear that I've had a lot of times like that in my life. But this is one of my favorite Bible verses, and it's brought me so much encouragement. And it's my prayer that it would encourage someone here today. Let's look at Psalm 34, 18. It says that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that you know each of us here by name. And Lord, you know which ones of us are here today with a heart that's heavy and burdened and hurting. I pray, Lord, that you would just surround each of us now with the arms of your love. I pray most of all, God, that as I speak, people will not see Bernadette, but that they will see you, Jesus, because without you, I'm nothing. And so I pray that you will be glorified in everything we say and do here today in Jesus' name. Amen. So what trials are you facing today? What are the secret things that break your heart that no one else knows but you? Is it a broken relationship or financial troubles? Maybe like me, it's something physical either in your life or someone you love. You know, the Bible tells us that when we cry out to God, he hears us and he delivers us from our troubles. But I think we would be honest if we admit that sometimes when the situation is unbearable, sometimes we wonder, even if it's just for a moment, if God realizes all that's going on, if maybe he has abandoned us, and we wonder if he's just watching as we suffer. Well, that's how my parents felt when they found out my prognosis, when they learned that their little girl will never walk and that she is not even expected to live past eight years old. I remember mom and dad crying that day. You see, friends, I was five years old, and believe it or not, eavesdropping was my favorite pastime. Even at that young age, I knew that big word. Because I always listened to conversations that were intended for me. And then, of course, like every child, I would blurt out everything I heard at a bad time. But on this day, the temptation was too big for me. We had just gotten home from a very important doctor visit. My parents talked about it for weeks. And we got home, and they were quiet. They put me in my room with coloring books and crayons. And then they went to their room, and they turned the door. Well, I heard crying. And so as I heard crying, you see, at five, I couldn't walk. And I did not have a wheelchair. The only thing I could do at that time was crawl. So imagine, as I hear them crying, I start to pull my little body down the hall, you know, going down the floor, and just crawling slowly to the room. And when I got there, and I looked in the crack of the door, what I saw broke my heart. Not only was my mom crying, but my daddy was crying. And my dad, he was a strong protector. He was strong, but not that strong. <laughs> he was the strong protector of our home. And at five years old, I honestly had never seen my daddy cry before. You see, I always believed that if my dad cried, maybe the world was ending. So I got even closer, hiding in the shadows, to find out what horrible thing is happening while my dad would cry and I found out that he was crying over me. They learned that day that I have a disease 
called infantile spinal muscular atrophy. Now, that's a form of muscular dystrophy, which we've all heard of. But this form, it affects children at birth, and it weakens their muscles to the point of death, usually by eight years old. As you can imagine, with that news, my parents were devastated. I looked in the room, I saw my dad, tears coming down his face. He had his hands lifted up at the ceiling like, why, God, why? He said, why are you letting this happen to us? He said, what have we done to deserve this? i never forget the moment because of what my mom said next. My mom turned to him. I remember tears streaming down her face. She said, what has our little girl done to deserve this? I remember at five years old thinking, I don't want to die. Even though I didn't really understand what dying meant. But I, I feared it already. And to see my parents crying like that totally, totally broke my heart. I really wanted to go in the room and let them just hug me, tell me everything will be all right. But I couldn't go in there. Why? Because eavesdropping got me in enough trouble before. In fact, friends, two weeks before that, this girl got in big trouble because I told everybody at my mom's dinner party that our neighbor, she wears a wig. So I couldn't go in. Instead, I turned around and I crawled back to my room with the weight of the world now on my five-year-old shoulders. As I was going to my room, I remember just every burden and I wanted only one thing, the only thing I could think about is I want a chance to grow up. I want a chance to be old. I was one of those little girls, and I'm sure everybody has either had a child or grandchild like this. I would ask every single adult I met, how old are you? And I remember, mom and dad told me they were 30. Well, when you're five, 30 is ancient. So that day I prayed my first prayer alone by myself without, you know, mom and dad leading me or anything. And I prayed straight from my heart, God, don't let it be true. I don't want to die. I said, God, could you let me live to be old like mom and daddy? Just let me live to be 30. I grabbed that number and I prayed that prayer night after night. Well, friends, I grew up in Jamaica, and to be honest, that was very hard. You see, back then, and still somewhat to this day, people with disabilities are treated like outcasts. Friends and family started to advise my family to put me in an institution and to replace me and our family by adopting a normal child. They said to them, and I heard them say, don't waste your time on her. In fact, don't educate her. Because nothing good will ever become of her life. I just remember hearing that over my life for years. Nothing good will ever become of her life. Well, my parents, they were determined to take care of me. But there wasn't much information about muscular dystrophy in Jamaica or even how to treat it. Physical therapists would try, but they would overexert my muscles, sprain my ankles, tear ligaments. You can hear me screaming and crying down the halls. My parents began to feel without hope, so they turned to other sources. At this time, they heard about a man on the island who was healing a lot of people, and people were lining up for miles to meet this man. So one day, out of desperation, and love for me, my mom and dad, and myself, they brought me and we joined the line. When we finally reached the man, he told us what we already knew. He said to them, without intervention, your child will die. He said, but leave her with me for two weeks. I'm gonna give her a special medication. I'm gonna mix up special medication, and then I'm gonna pray special prayers over her, and then he guaranteed my healing. You can imagine my parents only wanted to see me well. So they began to put their trust in that man.
but they had no idea as they were driving away that day that they just left me in the hands of a voodoo witch doctor. I was only seven years old. Their seven-year-old daughter now was participating and witnessing in animal sacrificing. And horrifying animal sacrificing where they burn the animal while it's alive. And at seven years old, watching the animal scream and cry until it's gone. I was so afraid that I would be next. The man made me drink blood. People danced around my body, chanting things over me, holding sticks in the darkness of fire. My heart started to become so cold against a God I didn't even know. I began to believe in my little heart, if there is a God, he hates me. He doesn't love me or even care, because why would he let all this happen to me? I felt abandoned by my parents, who were honestly only trying to help. When the two weeks came back, I'll never forget the day because I was so excited to see mom and dad, and oh my goodness, I wish you were with me, to see their face filled with disappointment when they saw me for the first time. Why? Because nothing had changed. I was the same way they left me there. Somehow, in the back of their minds, they were hoping their little girl would run to their arms. But I was still only crawling. The man said I was a difficult case. More time, more money will be necessary. But thankfully, I told my dad what was happening, and he decided we would go home right away. I was homeschooled up until that time, seven years old, and it was about then that my parents realized that I was extremely sociable, and I was growing in intelligence, and they thought we really need to put her in school to be with other children, at least for the social aspect. So they looked around Jamaica to find a school, but every principal would push my parents away. We don't want crippled children in this school. It's not a hospital. Finally, one school said, okay, we'll take her. If you pay double the price, of the other children for her. Loving me as much as they did my mom and dad, they paid double so I could have an education. But when I got to the school, children laughed at me horribly, and they teased me. And many of them would not even touch me because they were afraid to catch my disease. I want you to imagine if you came into this church, sat in the seat, and no one would sit to your left or your right or your right. That was my life every day in school in Jamaica. I remember one particular day I needed to use the bathroom at school, and my teacher asked two older girls if they would help me because our class had like 80 students. She couldn't leave them. So these two girls took me to the bathroom. This was a bathroom on the other side of the building, more private, where she told us other kids wouldn't bother us. They took me to that bathroom, sat me on the toilet, and they left me there the entire afternoon. I just cried and I cried, and I couldn't understand why no one loved me. I couldn't understand why no one wanted to be my friend, why I had to suffer so much, just because I'm different, just because I'm different. I didn't understand that. My teacher was so busy with the 80 kids, she didn't realize the one in the wheelchair is missing. It wasn't until my dad came at the end of the day to pick me up from school that he found me sitting on that same toilet. I was singing Bible songs that I learned in the school, but my toes were turned completely purple because of the lack of circulation my legs hanging down so long. Well, my parents heard about better opportunities for disabled children here in America, and they brought me to Miami the next year. But by this time, my lungs were on the verge of collapsing. You see, besides muscular dystrophy, 
I also develop scoliosis, which is where your spine is curved. Now, I know if you look at me, you all could see that I'm leaning, right? But at that time, just imagine for a moment, my head was hanging down, my body was hunched over forwards, kind of like the hunchback. In that position, I could barely breathe. And uh, I needed an emergency, spinal fusion surgery, where they put titanium rods on each side of your spine to straighten you out. But before they could even do the surgery, because my spine was so badly bent, they had to stretch me in traction for two weeks. For this, they had to drill little holes around the crown of my head and attach like a metal halo apparatus on my head. And then they hooked it to the head of the bed. To each of my knees, imagine they drove the screw going inside one side of my knee, coming out the other side, and they hooked a little horseshoe um, on each of my knees. Now, back at that time, they did all this to you while you were awake because they need to know if they hit a nerve. And so it was traumatizing for me. The pain would be so unbearable when they would stretch me just a fraction of an inch every day. And then I would cry and cry, and just when I got used to the pain, they would come back in my room and do it again. One night, they had just stretched me, and uh, they left the room, and I was by myself. I just cried out. God, I hate you. You don't love me. I said, God, look at me. Look at this body. I'm nothing more than a mistake, and it's a mistake that you made. And I told God, you know what? I don't want to live anymore. I can't live another day, another moment in this body, in this pain, in this horrible life. I told God, I can't. I can't. And I begged him hour after hour, please take my life. Now, you know, friends, I had prayed every day that God would let me live to be 30. But on this night, I was so broken. My heart was so broken and crushed that all I could say was, God, please, please take my life. Well, we just read in the Bible that God is near to the brokenhearted. And so even though I couldn't see God, or feel him in that moment, he was there. And likewise, as I see so many tears around the room, I want to let you know right now that if you're hurting today, the Bible promises us that he is near to the brokenhearted. So it's good news. I believe he's closer to us at that time. God is here. I made it through the nine-hour surgery. My parents remind me always that my heart stopped in the middle of the surgery. But God wasn't finished with me yet. I had to be homeschooled again for six months as I wore a full body cast for six months. I did so great at homeschool that when I went back to school, I skipped the ninth grade. Things began to turn around my life a little bit. In high school, I had friends. I started to participate in uh, after-school activities. I was the only girl in the wheelchair on the ladies' bowling team. I was even homecoming queen of North Miami Beach Senior High. <laughs> but something else was missing in my life. You know, you see me sitting here with you today in my wheelchair. But there's something you need to really understand about me. Friends, I'm, I'm just like you. And I have the same feelings that most people do. I have hopes and I have dreams. So as I was graduating, I began noticing boys. <laughs> and I wondered in my heart, what will be my future? Because just like every person in this room, I hoped for love. I wanted someone to love me as I am, bound to my wheelchair and losing strength able to do increasingly less and less for myself every day. But I thought to myself, who apart from my parents could ever love me this way? Who would want someone that would be totally dependent on him? Well, I turned again to God, 
Still, at this time, I didn't fully understand who God was. To be honest, the only thing I knew was that he's there, and he wants us to pray to him. That's all I knew. So I prayed for what I thought would be impossible, a husband. And I had no idea that God was already working on it. Now it's my first day of my second year of college, and I'm pretty upset. You see, I had failed the timed exam only because I didn't have the physical ability to do it fast enough. And because I didn't ask for assistance before the test, I was now being forced to do it over the class over again. So I want you to come with me to that day. I'm sitting outside the class. Doors closed beside me, and students are starting to come, but they're all talking to each other. And as they get near me, I turn my chair. Excuse me, excuse me, can you hold up? And the door would close in my face. So I'm just sitting there feeling sorry for myself. And along comes this wonderfully gorgeous man. <laughs> and I don't have to ask a thing. He comes up to me and says, can I help you? And he takes the books off my lap. He opens the door. He moves the desk. Oh my goodness, he sat next to me. I tell you guys what, it's a good thing I took that class before. I wasn't going to pay attention. <laughs> I could not take my eyes off that man. When the class was over, he picks up all my books. Where is your next class? I'll walk with you. And he walks with me across the campus to my next class. Friends, I went home on cloud nine. <laughs> I get to the door. <clears throat> I get to the door of my house. Mom, mom, I met the man I'm going to marry. I call my best friend on the phone. Girl, I just met the man I'm going to marry. Well, both had different responses. Mom quickly had to sit me down and have a little talk. And she said, just because a man is nice to you, sweetie, doesn't mean he wants to marry you. Well, my, my best friend, bless her heart, she got in her car fast as she could, came to my house with Bride's Magazine. <laughs> that girl is filled with faith, right? Well, this will show you. Sometimes God is working in our lives, even when we don't have a clue that he is. For me, that class is with you. In fact, I could take the class with my eyes closed. But thankfully, Mr. Jeff needed both his eyes open and then some. So that meant that I could become Jeff's tutor, which for me was great, because that means spending time with the man I'm going to marry, and he has to pay me for it. <laughs> well, I spent a few weeks tutoring Jeff, and it was wonderful. And one day, everything changed. I was on my way. I worked in financial aid at the school, and I was on my way to work, and I saw Jeff standing in the refund line. Well, I, my heart hit the floor. I did the quickest 360 you ever did see in a wheelchair, and I rushed over to him. I'd show you, but I might fall off this place. <laughs> I get over there to him, and I said, Jeff, what are you doing? He says, I have a lot going on in my life right now. This is not for me. And in my heart, I'm thinking, but I'm for you. Can't you see? I said, Jeff, you can do this. I'll help you. He said, no, no, I'm sorry. Well, I'm the one who was sorry. And I, I said, Jeff, you have my number. Stay in touch and we'll be friends. And I watched as he walked out of my life. Well, the first week, no phone call. Second week, no phone call. Finally, on the third week, he calls. Hi, Bernadette, I've missed you. He missed me. He said, can I come by the campus, have lunch with you? Oh, man, I was so excited. Jeff started coming to the campus just about every day for lunch. Now, Jeff always brought a Bible with him, but he didn't preach at me, and he didn't judge me. He basically extended the hand of friendship to me, and every day he told me how much God loved me, how important my life was. No matter how insignificant I felt, 
how important my life was to God. He would tell me all these things and tell me that even if I was the only person on the planet, Jesus would still go to the cross just for me. And Jeff told me these things for months, but that man would not ask me on a date. So I thought, I need to take this matter into my own hands. So I went to my parents. I said, Mom, Dad, you know my friend Jeff at the college. What if we'd like to go on a little date? Now, poor Jeff hasn't even officially asked me anything, but I'm trying to help the guy out. Immediately, my dad says, oh, honey, that'll be great, but you'll need to bring five friends to chaperone you. Five? Daddy, I'm 19. He says, well, I don't know him well, and I, I, you're in a wheelchair. I want to be extra careful. You must take five friends. Oh, man. Then my mom says, honey, don't worry. It's your birthday next week. You and your friends are going to go celebrate. Just ask Jeff to come along. He won't have a clue you've been chaperoned by five people. I said, mom, you're the best. So I rushed to the phone. Jeff. It's my birthday next week. My friends and I are going to go celebrate. Do you want to come along, be my date? Jeff's answer shocked me. He said, I'll be happy to go out with you and your friends if you'll come to church with me on Sunday. <laughs> church? I thought this is some kind of blackmail. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, church, I don't want to do the church thing. I've never been to church. I really don't want to do the church thing. But you know what? For this man, I'm doing the church thing. So I said, okay, I'll go. Well, as promised, Jeff goes out, me and my friends, equally as promised, he's at my house, bright and early Sunday morning, pick me up for church. Now, I want you to come with me to that Sunday. That Sunday was my actual birthday. I could not find five girlfriends to agree to chaperone me to church. So after much begging and pleading, for me and my mom, Daddy agreed that Jeff could take me to church alone. So I'm excited. It's my birthday, and in my heart, I'm going on a hot date to church. <laughs> so picture this. When Jeff comes to pick me up, me, mom, dad, brother, sister, we're all huddled in the front window watching Jeff. And as Jeff gets out of his car, he has a wonderful bouquet of flowers in his hands. And he has presents. And my family, they're pointing out the window, oh, you're getting flowers, you're getting presents. All I could say is, look at him, Mom, look at him, Dad, isn't he beautiful? <laughs> We're all looking at Jeff. Now, how many Jamaicans we have here? Raise your hand if you're Jamaican. All right, we got some Jamaicans. Well, my mom, Jeff goes to the door, my mom says, make him wait. Make him wait. My dad said, listen to your mother. He said, make him wait. We're going to make him wait. A young lady should never be over anxious. We make Jeff wait. The amount of time that my mom feels and she goes to the door. You know what Jeff does? He gives her the bouquet. Flowers are for my mom. Only one rose in that bouquet was for me. Well, I hope that the single men are listening right now, because by this time, mom was in love with him. <laughs> Jeff could take me anywhere, but he took me to church, and it was as if the pastor's message was written only for me that day. Turn your Bibles real quickly to Psalm 139. It'll come on the screen if you don't have one. I can still remember how the pastor said that God knows everything about us to the point that the hairs on our heads are numbered. We read these verses that day, and they changed my life forever. Let me share them with you right now. Psalm 139, 13 to 16. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's room. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. It says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, 
When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. I love this last part. Look at this. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Wow. All the days ordained for Bernadette, for John, for Bill, for Sally, whatever your name is, were written in God's book before one of them came to be. For the first time in my life, I realized that day I am not a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. He actually thought of me and you before he ever placed us in our mother's womb. And he planned on my life. I realized that day that, yes, when people see me, when you see me, you see a girl with different abilities than you. But when God looks at me, he sees a daughter who he created in his own image, even if we don't understand that. And when he looks at me, just like he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything he created, he looked back and said, it is good. He looks at me and all my frailty and my weakness, and I could hear him whisper, she's good. She's good. I realized that day that if God created me on purpose, he must have a purpose for my life. And it was in the exact moment that I had that thought that I heard the minister say, God has a purpose for all of us but none of us will ever get to fulfill it unless we open our hearts to him. It's almost like a a mystery that cannot be unfolded unless we open our hearts to him. Why would he ever give us the purpose if we don't allow him in our lives? So on that day, my 20th birthday, I gave my life to Jesus because I wanted to see why. Did you even create me? I wanted to know. And I realized that he loved me more than the suffering that I had endured. His love for me was greater than that. Well, that day, one of the small, uh, one of the birthday gifts Jeff gave me, besides um, my first Bible, was a small ring with a heart. And the ring fell off my finger, it was too big. So Jeff took it back to be resized. Six days later was, Valentine's Day, and we were out on our second official date. I have to say official, because Jeff feels that all those days at the college was dating. It's not. (laughs) So we're out on our second official date, and Jeff hands me a flower. When he puts the flower up to my face, I saw my ring there. Friends, when I pulled the ring out, now it had a diamond on it. I said, Jeff, what does this mean? And he said, will you marry me? Oh, I was so excited. And then I thought, let me not get too excited. Perhaps Jeff doesn't fully understand what it would mean to marry a girl like me. I said, Jeff, I am bound to this wheelchair for life. It's not going to get better. He says, I love you. It doesn't matter. I said, Jeff, but I will get weaker and weaker as the years go by. And that means more and more will be required of you. He says, I love you. It doesn't matter. I said, Jeff, it's fatal. It's fatal. You're going to be a widower at a young age. He says, Bernadette, can't you see? If I could just spend today with you, it's worth more than spending the rest of my life without you. Marry me, he said. Well, praise the Lord, only three months later, Jeff and I got married. And God has really blessed me, friends. You know, throughout all the pain and all the suffering that I described to you today, even when I didn't know God, he was still there. And he was there working through all those things and through all those painful circumstances to do the impossible in my life. My question to you this morning is, what in your life feels impossible right now? What feels impossible? I am here today as living proof that with God, all 
things are possible. I told you that at five years old, I began praying and asking God to allow me to live to the old age of 30. I am so excited to let you know, this past February, I celebrated my 48th birthday. <laughs> our God, our God is a God of miracles. And he can turn teardrops into rainbows. All of you that are crying in this room, write that down. God can turn my teardrops into rainbows. He did it for me, friends. He did it for me. Again, I ask, what feels impossible today? Nothing is impossible with our God. Nothing. You know, here I am. I'm the one that they said that nothing good would ever become of her life. And yet this year in May, Jeff and I celebrated 28 years of marriage. 28 years. I enjoy a normal life. A pastor said to me this week, it's not normal, it's extraordinary. I enjoy a normal life and I continue to amaze my doctors, thanks to God. And it hasn't always been easy. I would be lying if I told you that it's easy to live life in this wheelchair, it's not. I, I have deteriorated over Jeff and I, our 28 years of marriage. I've gotten weaker and weaker every year. Today, little things like feeding myself or brushing my teeth have become impossible without Jeff's help. I can't reach out to shake your hands. I cannot reach out to hug my own husband anymore. But friends, I have a heart to love. And I have a voice. And I promised God that I would use my voice to tell anyone who will listen about his love for us. You know, I think when things happen to us, we always ask why. And sometimes we allow that question of why to stop us and bind us, keep us from living the full life that God has for us. The disciples asked Jesus the same thing, and I love it. I love what he answered. Let's look at John chapter 9. For the sake of time, just look at the screen. John 9, verse 1 to 3, my favorite story in the Bible. It says, as he, and he is Jesus. So as he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciple asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned said Jesus, but get this, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Friends, everything that happened to me happened so the work of God could be shown in my life. And no matter, and no matter what you're going through here today, no matter what it is causing your tears, God wants to show his works and his glory in and through your life. Whatever it is, I want you to think about it for a minute. I want you just to draw a little circle around yourself, and I want you to think of the most difficult circumstance that you're going through right now. Whatever it is that has happened or is happening, God already knew it would happen. God already knew that you would be in this situation. And in the same way that God knew that this would happen, he also knows what he can do with it, what he can do through it, and how he can turn it into a thing of beauty. But here's the key, and this is where I've learned to live a freer life. The key is, are we gonna let him? We saw now that we know from these scriptures that God wants to show his works and his glory through our lives. But are we allowing the work of God to be shown in our lives? 
Or have we been complaining? Have we been complaining? God didn't give me legs that can run around this church. And I told you my arms are too weak to reach out to you. And yet, I still want God to work through me. I sat in my church, God, can you use someone like me who cannot even move? And I told God, you know the best thing that works in my body is my mouth. <laughs> and maybe I could use it for your glory. Amen. And I whispered a little prayer, God, to send me wherever I'll go. Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> God has sent me around the world, friends. Me, I, I just, I, when I say it, I need you to understand I can't believe it. Because I'm weak, I'm really weak. I can only move this thumb. I have the voice, and if we were to turn off the mics, my voice is very low. My lungs are weak. I'm not strong. And just every year when I think God is going to put me on the sidelines, bench me for a while, he puts me out in the middle of the field. He does. Because he wants to still show his glory through my life. I never dreamed that God would use me as a missionary or that he would send me around the world. Now he has called us, my husband and I, to go to Sierra Leone. And it's so clear that we're supposed to go in Sierra Leone. If you have any disability or even a deformity, say you're missing a finger, you are outcast. No one will hire you, no man will marry you, you are put out. And a missionary there, heard me speak at a conference and asked me, will you come to Sierra Leone and let these women see you in your wheelchair? Much worse than they, how much God can do through you, how much more he could do through them. I know that God is calling me to Sierra Leone, even though that's where Ebola started. I'm showing you this because if God could send me all the way to Sierra Leone with one thumb and a voice. How much more could he do through you right here in Hollywood? How much more could he do through you right here in this church if we would just allow him to work in our lives?